So welcome everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the CEO and founder of DNA Behaviour. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another Identity EQ interview. And I've got the great fortune to have with me John Locker, who is the CEO and founder of Maximum Impact Partners. And we've been working together for the last 10 or so years uh, between um, Maximum Impact and, uh, and DNA Behaviour. And Maximum Impact does a lot of work in the financial services industry with fund managers, wealth managers, and particularly sales focused people and have got a, a specialty in human behavior as well, which is, which is where we fit in. So John, why don't you tell me a little bit more about your career journey to, to where you're at today with Maximum Impact? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's been a long journey. <laughs> I've been in business uh, now, you know, well over 40 years. And um, I originally started in the banking business in Chicago. I worked for uh, several, uh, worked for a savings alone to start out with. And then I worked for several uh, small community banks. Uh, and I was able to kind of move the needle from a career standpoint every time I made a, made a change. And I was always able to uh, move myself up from a, a authority position to where I was the chief operating officer and chief financial officer of the last bank that I worked for when I was 28 years old. Yep. And uh, from that point, uh, the bank that I worked for uh, in Chicago, it was in downtown Chicago. We, uh, we did such a good job of getting the bank turned around in a period of two years that the bank was sold out from under us by the owner. And I decided to take a different track and go into marketing and went to work for marketing agency in Chicago, which I really enjoyed uh, the change there. And um, then I made a short detour going back to work with uh, one of the fellows that I had worked with at this last bank to start an entrepreneurial uh, paper distribution business that lasted a couple of years. But eventually I got back I decided I wanted to really be back in this marketing world. And I went back to work for the, uh, what was at the time, the largest sales promotion agency in, in the country, Frankel and Company. And I was brought into uh, Frankel to introduce uh, financial services into the, into the agency. And I went out and spent the first year that I was there developing a business development plan and then scouring the country for new clients. And we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, get a, a series of very large projects from Citicorp yep. or uh, a new venture that they were working on that was the precursor to uh, national banking here in the US. At the time, uh, banks weren't allowed to operate across state lines and they were as big organizations like Citicorp always do, pushing the needle, trying to figure out ways to use some of the different subsidiaries that they had. They had a mortgage banking subsidiary, they had a uh, consumer credit finance subsidiary. And so we, we worked with them for over a year, uh, testing different concepts of delivering banking services uh, to, at, at the retail level. And uh, eventually we ended up picking up the New York Banking Division, which was their you know, largest uh, bank. And uh, we're doing all of the promotion and uh, new product launches for the, uh, for the bank in New York, which was pretty much of a coup for us because you know, here's a promotion agency from Chicago uh, invading New York, which is the home of all of the world's largest advertising and marketing agencies. And we were able to uh, pick up that business and 
and develop it. And uh, so over about a four, four or five year period of time, we developed that business into the second largest uh, business in the agency behind McDonald's. And at the time, uh, our, um, our client at McDonald's, uh, we were the, you know, the largest sales promotion agency working for McDonald's at the time and had been very instrumental in helping them introduce uh, Happy Meals and doing a lot of uh, very big uh, promotions around the Olympics and so, so on and so forth. Uh, nationally. So uh, I was recruited out of that agency to then uh, work for Naveen Investments in Chicago as their uh, chief marketing officer. And uh, I was there for about 10 years and had uh, quite a quite an interesting career while I was there uh, because I there was uh, Naveen, while they were a very well-known uh, investment company in the securities industry, they did not have a, a real large marketing organization set up in the, in the company. So I went from uh, presiding over a marketing department of two to three people to uh, having 38 people reporting to me by the time I left there 10 years later and going from a uh, marketing about budget of around 2 million to around 30 million when I left uh, that include the, included all the advertising and everything we were doing there. And I left, uh, uh, I left Nuveen at uh, the end of 1997 because I decided that I wanted to go out into my own and have my own business. And um, that's when we started Maximum Impact Partner. And then, and then uh, six months later, my wife, Amy, who I had met while I was at Nuveen, and you know well, very well. Yep. Um, uh, Amy joined me uh, as part of Maximum Impact Partners. In fact, I was, uh, I was out to lunch one day, and she had left Nuveen and was getting ready to go speak for a, a national sales meeting for one of her uh, uh, former clients at Nuveen who had asked her to speak. And uh, she was there typing up her bio when I walked in and uh, I looked over her shoulder and lo and behold, while I was out at lunch, she declared herself as president of the Maximum Impact Partners. And uh, so I, we had a little bit of a hostile takeover while I was at lunch and I didn't even <laughs> do that. So, uh, but we worked together and initially we had two very separate businesses within Maximum Impact Partners. Obviously I was more focused, focused on marketing and research type projects. Yeah. She was very focused on uh, working with salespeople and developing, um, doing training and development work with salespeople. And that was about, um, uh, that was in, in 1998, by the time we got into the early 2000s, uh, she had left the working with uh, uh, another firm that was uh, her largest client, and she had a non-compete with them in the United States. So we ended up uh, making some contacts through AIG and built a huge uh part of our business from, I would say, 2002 to 2009 in Southeast Asia, working with uh, 18 different, different companies within, within AIG. And we helped them do everything from introduce uh, and train their salespeople to launch new products in Japan we helped them launch a dollar denominated uh, fixed annuity there. And they sold, uh, I wanna say five or $6 billion worth of this product in the first wow. year that they were there. So um, we also got involved with helping them rebrand all of these different companies under the AAG name because they were all known as separate entities in the different countries that they uh, uh, were representing. 
And that was interesting. And that came to an abrupt halt during the 2008-2009 financial downturn. And uh, because they now, as you might recall, AIG was had a very big problem here in the US, a big, huge liquidity problem that uh, they were one of the poster children for you know, being the uh, bailout, uh, bailout recipients of the federal government. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, ironically, they went in Southeast Asia where they had no problems and they had high liquidity and, you know, they didn't have the problems that, that they were facing here in the U.S. and in London. Uh, the, all those companies went back to using their old, old names. So all this work that we had just put in on the, the rebranding using the AIG name, they went back to firm names like AIA, which was is probably the, and I'm sure you're familiar with being from Australia, AIA is probably the, you know, the largest uh, insurer in Southeast Asia. Yeah, yeah. So um, this was about the time where we decided that, uh, and in the meantime, I had uh, taken a little excursion away from our company for about a, uh, about 16 months, where I became uh, the chief marketing officer of Cole Capital in uh, Phoenix, and uh, which is which prompted our move from Chicago out to Phoenix, which is where we're now uh, located, and we've been out here for 15 years, and. Um, Cole was a, was a client of ours and they were putting a new management team together. So uh, one of the people that was coming in kind of heading up the distribution side of the business was a former client of ours and he recruited me to come in and be the chief marketing officer, which I did. And uh, so we moved our, we moved Maximum Impact Partners to Phoenix and then I went to work for Cole. And I was only there for about a year or so because it, it turned out uh, one of the things that was attracting me to this opportunity was that uh, they had been in the real estate investment business for um, about 20 years. And I had always been in, interested in that segment of the investment marketplace. And I had never really had an opportunity to work there. So uh, I, this was a, a great chance to do that in a company that was well-established and well-known. Except what I found, what I found when I got out here was more like working for a startup. Uh, yeah. And uh, on top of it, there was a, a little bit of a, a palace feud going on between the new team that was coming in and the team that had been there. And uh, so, after about a year of going through this, I thought to myself, you know, in 1998, I left a, com- a big company to go and start my own business and be in control of my own uh, world. And why did I do this? So I left and I went back to Maximum Impact Partners. And this is about the time that we made a connection with you. Yep. And um, so I was uh, so amazed at how accurate my uh, business DNA profile was when I first got it. And that it told me why I had made that decision to start Maximum Impact Partners because that was part of my natural behavior is to want to be in control of things. And when I look back over my career, uh, I really wish in particular when I was at Nuveen, I would have had those tools, the business DNA tools, uh, to work with in our organization because I, you know, we were, we were, we were very intently working on developing what we called a learning organization at the time. And I think having the business DNA tools would have really uh, enhanced the business dramatically had we had them. And in particular for me, uh, as I, you know, as I had mentioned, I had gone from only managing a couple people to managing 38 people I was while I was there. And it certainly would have helped me as a manager to better understand myself and also understand 
the people that were reporting to me. So when I, when I left Cole and I went back to Maximum Impact Partners, uh, I decided that we were going to, uh, Amy and I decided jointly, that we were gonna really focus on building up the training and development side of the business and start de-emphasizing the marketing side of things that we were doing. It wasn't that we were not gonna do marketing projects, but I wanted, I wanted to get focused on what I believed and what she believed to be the real future of the business. And that was um, uh, using what we were learning about through business DNA as a, a way to help our clients change the behavior of their, of their companies. And in particular, it, you know, we've always worked with the sales organizations within the companies that we work for. And we work for some very large companies in the financial services business. In fact, you know, just to digress for a second, when, when I set up Maximum Impact Partners, I only wanted to work in the financial services industry because I, I wanted to be able to help our clients bring an A team to whatever project that they needed to have. So we built this, we built out this network of about 25 independent consultants and small boutique firms that had this very vast range of capabilities that we could essentially do everything from launch products to do research to train salespeople, to um, uh, basically do everything in the that related to the sales and branding process that supported the company's products and services, with the exception of actually going and selling the product for them. Yeah, uh, and in some cases, we had a couple clients where we actually helped them put a sales organization together by going in, out and finding a third-party marketing firm to help them come and distribute their products. So um, kind of fast forward into the 2010 going forward period. Uh, that's really when we committed very heavily to using business DNA in uh, all of our engagements with our clients. And it helped us uh, help our clients really transform their business. And so, um, uh, so now, I, you know, we really consider ourselves to be a behavioral-based uh, training and development, uh, professional development firm that works with uh, some of the largest companies in the financial services industry today. We've, we've really established quite a big practice within the retirement services industry. Uh, we work with John Hancock, um, a mass Mutual, which is over the last year, is, was purchased by Empower, which is one of the largest providers of retirement services. And, um, and then we, um, we pretty much work with every large retirement services provider in the U.S. over the last uh, 10 years in some, way, some manner. And, uh, you know, we also have a number of mutual fund companies. Uh, Columbia Threadneedle is one of our uh, largest client, as well as Nuveen. And uh, it's kind of funny. It took us uh, 20 years to get back into Nuveen after we left. But uh, we've really uh, enjoyed working with the folks at Nuveen. And uh, there's many people that we work with while we were there are still there. So even though they've their organization has transitioned and gone through a number of different uh, ownership changes since we left. So it's really been quite a journey, hasn't it, John, over, over the 23 years uh, with uh, Maximum Impact, you know, from your side starting off on more of the marketing side and Amy on more the training, so, training coaching side, and, and in a way, you've brought them together with behavioral-based programs that you, you work more with the sales uh, people inside these financial services outfits to, to help them improve the business and transform their businesses. Right. One of the things that we developed uh, over the last seven years, and we, 
we keep refining it and uh, developing it further is a is an assessment program that we call the combine, the maximum yep. impact sales combine. And um, we recognized that one of the problems our, our clients had was that they had, uh, they always had limited budgets for training and development. And it was always one of the first budgets that got cut whenever there was a, you know, the clients needed to, to cut their budgets. And so uh, we saw clients kind of using the same model that had been used for training people for many, many years where, you know, they would bring everybody together and they would train everybody on the same thing all the time. Well, the fact of the matter is it was a waste of training dollars because not everybody needed to be trained on the same thing. You know, some people needed to be trained on certain skills and other people needed other skills. And we often would be, uh, have a, a training event at a national sales meeting that the client had set up and they had everybody from the person that had just shown up two weeks ago to a guy who had been in the business for 30 years. And yeah. obviously they're at different points in, in their, uh, in the learning process. So, uh, our answer to that was to create this uh, assessment methodology that we mirrored off of the NFL combine where all of the teams come together and the coaches come together to look at all of the uh, rookies that are going to go through the draft and evaluate them on uh, the same set of skills. And we said, you know, salespeople, no matter whether they're selling retirement products or they're selling mutual funds, they all need to be good at the same set of skills. So we developed the combine and one of the elements of the combine is the business DNA assessment of each person that goes through the combine. So that really, once we instituted the business DNA discovery uh, process into the combine, it really changed, it added, an, it, it elevated the, the assessment of what we were doing to a new level. Yeah. Because uh, not only were people, were the managers of these organizations that we were working with able to now see the difference in the skill sets of everybody that, that was going through the assessments. But now they could understand the behavior behind what was driving the performance there. And so uh, this has really helped us to help our clients look at their whole organization in a way that they've never been able to do it before. And what we found out in, in running the combine, which on the surface, it appears that it's really um, for the benefit of the managers to understand the different skills that everybody brings to the table. And we, because we would put them all through these drills <clears throat> and then we would rank them accordingly. And then that would give them a roadmap to understand where they needed to put their training dollars. Yep. Um, but more than that, it gave them insights into uh, why people were behaving the way they were uh, in certain situations, as well as uh, typically what happens in most distribution organizations is they have a group of in internal salespeople working with a group of external salespeople that are in the field and they pair them up. So, you know, it's usually a one-to-one -one relationship, although sometimes uh, an internal salespeople will be covering multiple externals. Um, but the business DNA profile allowed us to look at the, those uh, dynamics that were going on between within those teams. And we started uh, within one of our clients, we said, why don't we look at the performance, the sales performance, and then look at the different profiles of the people that make up the sales teams. 
let's see if there's some correlation between high performance sales and certain types of uh, uh, profiles, business DNA profiles. And it was fascinating to see the results. And we could, not only that, but we could also pinpoint why some teams weren't working well together. So um, it, it's given our clients this, this unique advantage of being able to change the performance dyna dyna dynamics of their sales teams in a way that goes way beyond just the skills that they have to bring to the table and have to be good at in order to be good salespeople. It's really all now based on uh, people's natural and learned behaviors. Yeah, I think what, what you've really done there with the sales combine is you've now got an inside out read on the business and how the business works from, from the human motivation of, of the salespeople. That's really what you've done. Yeah. Um, you know, the irony of the, irony of, the um, of what we've seen go on with our clients that have used the combine as a, as a tool is that they have seen their sales go up post the combine by as much as 10 to 12% by doing nothing other than putting their people through this assessment process. Because just the process of knowing that you're going to be evaluated and assessed gets people to focus on what they are there to do, which is go out and sell whatever the product or service is in a way a little bit different than they did, you know, prior to coming into the combine. So, so John, if we take, you know, you and your role in all of this and as a, as a uh, you know, an initiator, which is your business DNA style, yeah. and you're also coming with that extremely creative, um, also a risk taker, you know, how, 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 did, how, how have you seen that play out in, in, in the design of this? Well, um, I think kind of every stage along the way as we've developed Maximum Impact Partners over the years, um, we've taken <clears throat> a series of risks and some of them haven't worked out. You know, yep. early on, um, Amy and I had vastly different perspectives on uh, what the organization would look like. She didn't want any employees at all. And, you know, I come from an environment where I'm a manager. So I'm yep. looking for, I'm, I want to manage a team of people. And so, you know, one of the first compromises, which worked out very well, was to create this network of uh, very experienced sales, uh, very experienced professionals in these diverse areas of sales and marketing. And pulled together teams as we needed them. And then, you know, we would, I would manage the projects with these different people. Uh, Amy tended to want to stay focused on what she was doing with the client and not essentially have a team of people working uh, on, on uh, the projects with her, which was ca very characteristic even when we were, we first met each other and were working at Naveen. You know, I was always collaborating with people in the organization and she had a very uh, singular focus on her channel of distribution and a team of people that she was managing, but she tended to really want to do things pretty much on her own. And, um, but, you know, along came this decision to move more uh, uh intently in the, in the focus of working on the development of sales, the sales organizations. And um, it also required, as we went into the, the build out of the combine, that we needed to bring some of these people in our network into the combine to work with us as assessors, uh, because they had, you know, we had people who had been 
heads of distribution at some of these mutual fund companies or retirement services companies uh, who left and came to work with us, you know, as, as, it, uh, as what we call impact partners. They're independent consultants, but they work under our umbrella. And so the combine now features uh, assessors from maximum impact partners working alongside assessors from the company whose people are going through. And the assessors from the company tend to be the managers of these people. Yeah. So we work in, in concert with that. And one of the great things about that is that we have an objectivity that the managers don't have. Typically, one of the things that we run into with the managers is that they have a lot of bias, particularly as it relates to their own people. So if they happen to be assessing, um, you know, let's say uh, consultative selling, if they're an assessment for, uh, assessor for consultative selling, they're going to look at their people differently than the, you know, the other managers, people who are going to be brought before them uh, to do the assessment. And uh, so we help the maximum impact partners assessors help kind of balance out this bias because we don't have a bias. You know, we just have a bias on the right way to do something. And what, what ends up growing out of this is that the managers get a whole new perspective on what excellent means in their organization. Yeah. Because, you know, prior to the combine, each one of them was defining what excellent looked like in their division. They hired the people for the division. They trained the people for the division and they decided what, the best high performance and excellence look like. But when, we, when you get them all together, working together across the combine, they now start to see the gaps that exist uh, that largely start in the hiring process. So what's uh, over time, what's, what, what's happened is most of our clients have started to use the business DNA uh, tools to assess people in the hiring process now, which is really where this all starts because it, now we know the kind of people we're looking for or the client does the, they, based on the behavioral profiles that they've uh, seen as successful in these different in parts of the organization. And now that when they go out to look for somebody, that's what they're looking for. So you've got people to see uh, where, the, where the root cause of the problem is uh, at the end of the day through the data and to look into places where, where they probably weren't thinking they needed to look. Right. And actually, you know, we've also learned through working with you in your organization that um, all kinds of people can be successful. There isn't one profile. Yeah business DNA profile that is more successful than the next. It's just a matter of how the person's behavior manifests itself in their situation that they're in, in the, and, and the organization that they work for. Yeah, which, which gets down to, you know, has a person got the, emo <clears throat> the emotional intelligence to do the job? Are they, are they, are they able to adapt? But at the same time, having all of this data in the sales combine helps you see those that have managed to do it and those that can't. Definitely. And then what to do with it in terms of should they still stay in their job or do you give them more training or different types of training you know, on a customised basis and coaching to uh, allow them to flourish and go even further? Because I, I imagine you probably see some A-minus players that you can take to be A+. Plus, um, and you, and you see some B minus players that maybe should just be replaced um, or, or with the right coaching, they can go, they can, they, they can, um, they can, they can go further. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, some, some people might, you know, end up uh, be better suited for a relationship management role there rather than a sales role. Yeah. 
And so that's another thing that comes out of this is that clients are able to see that, um, you know, this person might be more successful over here. And they often, you know, several times they've, they've moved people around into different roles and people have succeeded. Um, I, one of the things that I have really found it, found fascinating about working with the business DNA tools that we, we use um, has been uh, understanding how different people are incented by different things. You know, in a sales world, most people think, uh, everybody's incented by making more money. And, you know, we found out that that's clearly not the case. Yeah. So, but I, I think the, the, you know, the other area that we're now embarking on with your help is moving over into financial DNA. And we've, you know, typically uh, the history of our organization has been working with, sales organizations who deal with financial advisors. So the financial advisor hasn't been our primary client during the 23 years that we've been in business. We know just about everything there is to know about the way financial advisors behave and they do things because our clients have to sell to them. So we have to know how, uh, financial advisors operate, and more specifically, how the retail organizations of uh, the companies they work for, like Merrill Lynch or the big banks or you know some of these independent uh, firms like LPL or whoever it might be, or just independent uh, uh, RIAs, um, how they operate. And uh, we have to know those things. So we think that, that understanding that whole ecosystem, I guess you could say, of uh, our clients as the manufacturers of the products, selling those products or to advisors, actually what they do is they influence the sale of those products. They don't actually sell the products to the advisors. To convince the advisors to represent their products rather than someone else's to the end investor. So because we understand that whole loop, um, we think that we're in a, in a good position to begin helping organizations understand now how to take the financial DNA tools and work, it, work those into their practice to work with uh, investors which i think i think john with your and just as we wrap up here with with this uh you know with your marketing background as well which really came out to me today is how you innovate you know these behavioral based programs inside the financial services firm on a 360 basis um you know, I know you started at the sales end, but as you said, as you see now, you can get to the financial advisor end of it, helping them with their business. And it's a full 360 uh, at, at the end of the day, which is really what we've been wanting to, to see happen. Uh, right. Yeah, I think, I think that the, you know, being on the receiving end of working with a financial advisor, we've, we've, we've always, even though we've been, in the financial services industry and we work with investment products all of our careers, we still use a financial advisor for our own personal finances. And so understanding that whole process and, um, and seeing how, it's op- how we've operated with two or three different people over our, our business careers, <clears throat> personally uh, managing our money the, the missing link has been the behavior, our behavior and the, and the advisor's behavior and how we come together or don't come together. Yeah. That's it, oftentimes people wonder why, why don't I get along with my financial advisor? And it's because, you know, we're coming from different places and we don't understand that. 
we understood it better, we might still be working with them. Now, so, I, I, and I think at the end of the day, John, as we wrap up here, what we're going to do, what we're going to do with, together is innovate the, actually the marketing of these firms. And, and I know that this is taking place through training programs right now uh, with behaviour heavily baked in. But, but I even said it to one of my team today, really, we're going to turn into a marketing agency uh, at some point for financial services firms and wealth managers uh, with what we do, because because all, all of that at the end of the day is uh, behaviorally driven because we, we understand the motivations of people. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's something that maybe for, for you and me to have another conversation about an, another day. Uh, but, but I really want to thank you, John, for uh, spending the time with me to, you know, with, with the conversation today. And uh, is there any parting words you'd like to have for our listeners? No, I just, uh, you know, um, I'm an unabashed cheerleader for DNA behavior. Um, we, have, uh, we have several other partners, partner firms we work with. Uh, Lego, as you're probably familiar with, is another one of our uh, our partner firms that we have very close working relationship with. Um, but, you know, I, I think that you've helped us transform our business so we can help our clients transform our business, transform their business. And uh, we're looking forward to, you know, uh, now doing that on that advisor side of things. And you're helping us transform as well. So, uh, you know, it's mutual. So thank you so much, John. Thanks, you. Appreciate the time.